So uh, coming to uh, other areas where the stroke it is useful, this is a, uh, probably reported as a non-hemorrhagic stroke in a CT. You can see the diffusion restriction is fairly acute stroke. You can see these blood products or even stages of the veins. So SWA can actually detect a hemorrhagic transformation or stages of the veins, which is quite early and uh, which could actually uh, design your therapeutic strategy, especially when you are talking about uh, design therapeutic strategies uh, for um, uh, stroke protocols rather than looking at the time interval windows for stroke therapy. So see so some of the other applications of SWA, you can actually see how hemorrhagic transformation is happening within, uh, a, within an, an infarct. More than that, you can actually see the MCS susceptibility sign. Anybody who is looking at uh, CT studies uh, for stroke are familiar with the dense MCS sign, the equivalent in conventional gradient echo sequence is an MCS susceptibility sign, which could be much better detected on an SWA sequence. Why? Because SWA has got a positive phase difference between arterial blood and thrombose blood or venous blood. You can see these arteries in the middle cerebral artery as very bright on the magnitude images, and you can see these veins I mean, sorry, you can see this thrombus which is called a paramagnetic substance which is actually occupying this part of the artery. So you can see this thrombus sitting, so this is called SWA susceptibility sign. So you should always look at the face, magnitude, your SWI imaging as well as your magnitude image. If you look at only the magnitude image, you probably may miss it although the vessel size is actually blooming out here so you probably won't miss that. So how many have actually heard about a PCA susceptibility sign? PCA, dense PCA sign is seldom described on CT scan because it is very difficult to detect because you see the tentorial margins are hyperdense and you, your diagnostic confidence is quite low. Whereas in a posterior circulation stroke, the susceptibility sign is very, very useful, especially when you are using a susceptibility weighted imaging. We are actually submitted uh, a study in uh, a retrospective study in AJNR which showed that the posterior circulation, the susceptibility sign has got a much higher sensitivity and specificity compared at least to CT in, co in comparison to MR and geography. So this is, uh, it can actually do much more than detecting the susceptibility, uh, uh, the artifacts detected within the thrombose vessels. So for example, this is a 60-year-old woman with left MCA stroke just outside the stroke window. When you do perfusion, you can see this, uh, the mean transit time, at least in the periphery, is increased. It's already infarcted tissue here. So the mean transit time is increased. What happens is that the blood is taking more time to pass through this. The, 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 the oxygen extraction uh, within these way, uh, the, the vessels will be high. So the, the deoxyhemoglobin within the veins especially the transmedullary veins and the cortical veins are going to be high. So Keisha has published a paper which saying that can susceptibility weighted imaging uh, predict the cerebral hypoperfusion? Can we predict the, the, the increased oxygen extraction fraction? Probably yes because you can actually have a very good correlation between uh, the the perfusion imaging as well as susceptibility weighted imaging. Again, if you can actually get the information you wanted without injecting a lot of contrast for perfusion, it's going to make a, a practice parameter change. Although I'm telling you all these things are in the preliminary stages of evaluation, nobody has validated it really, so it will take some more time to come to clinical practice. So why do we need to look at the oxygen extraction fraction? Is it an academic curiosity? No. If, if it's another case which is of similar age, 57-year-old man with the right MCA stroke, similar severe uh, large infarct, you can see that the contrast enhancement, the early contrast enhancement of the vessels here, we know that this happens when there is rarely reperfusion. We see that the, 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 the veins in these areas are actually disappearing. Veins in these areas are actually disappearing because more of blood is, or arterial blood is getting pumped to this area. That means there is an early reperfusion happening. So more oxygen is available there. So the deoxyhemoglobin concentration within this area is less. That means the oxygen extraction fraction is less or the oxygen supply is more than extraction. What does that mean? If we, we, from our previous experience and papers from AJNR, we know that the perfusion, the early reperfusion is actually a, considered to, to be a bad thing because it can actually bleed. So this is what exactly we detect in SWA. You can see that the blood products already happening this, when, uh, these infarcts. Although these are preliminary anecdotal findings, the exact clinical validity is that has to be uh, validated further. So compared to 2D gradient echo sequence and SWI, you can actually detect a deep uh, uh, venous infarct. You can see that the venous sinus thrombosis. You can see these, uh, the cortical veins getting uh, prominent. You can see that the internal, uh, uh, the, the, the 
medial thalamus showing hemorrhagic transformation the vein of labi thrombosis there you can see hemorrhagic transformation with the venous infarct in the temporal lobe but SW will give you more information that you have the face, you look at the face, then the face shows a positive face here because of the, 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 the orientation of the veins and the, uh, you can see that this vein is actually swollen and it's actually blooming and there is a face change. And if you look at the face change between the internal cerebral veins and the straight sinus, which is more or less parallel uh, in uh, direction, you can see that the internal cerebral vein has got a different face compared to the, the straight sinus. So it's again that the internal cerebral vein thrombosis is the cause of this hemorrhage and this is the vein of labia, which is thrombosis, the same case. So which is again proved by contrastinence MR venography. So compared to this bilateral antithalamic infarcts, Till now, we, we write a lot of differential, including Wernicke's encephalopathy, arterial infarct, artery of Percheron infarct, the venous infarct. So if you look at this diffusion, there is a pretty classical of artery infarcts, but we are not sure. Look at the face imaging. You can see that the face, internal cerebral veins are actually patent. They show the same face as the straight sinus. We are pretty sure that it's not a venous thrombosis, which has produced this infarct, probably an artery of Percheron infarct. So again, the dural venous sinus thrombosis and the dural arterial venous fistula, which shows significant venous collateralization and oxygen extraction fraction change. So you can actually detect uh, small uh, dural fistulas only better by SWA. This is, for example, a T2-weighted imaging. Patient has got raised up CP features. We were stamped as benign intracranial hypertension, but we saw these small uh, veins and we ordered for an SWI and we could see these veins and we did a, a MR angiography and later an angiography showed this tiny dural fistula which is the cause of this uh, raised intracranial pressure. It's clinically very very important to detect because if you do an LP and these patients are going to deteriorate because of the high intracranial pressure due to dural fistula. So, so you should be pretty sure what you are actually looking at. So intracranial hypertension also SWI may contribute to uh, contribute to the diagnosis. Uh, hypertensive microbleeds, SWA shows my, much more microbleeds than uh, conventional gradient echo sequences, cerebral amyloid antipathy, you can see the subcortical small hemorrhagic changes, you can see superficial siderosis better on SWA, again you can see that the, the, it has got a positive face and it is not calcification, so even if it is not geometrically round, sometimes you can actually show the, the lesions. So there are papers from 1980s from radiology which says that the low-grade gliomas tend to bleed less compared to high-grade gliomas. The exception probably is a, a pilocytic astrocytoma which can actually bleed. So this is a low-grade glioma diffuse a fibrillary astrocytoma of the lamus. You can see that the veins are getting shifted but there are no much hypo intensity such as bleed within these lesions. Compared to this glioblastoma multiform, you can see this multiple venous vasculature which is, and also blood products which suggest that this is a highly malignant lesion. Again, perfusion will prove this, but we can, can we do without perfusion? That is the question. Again, differentiating between acoustic schinomas and meningiomas in the CP angle, it's a very minimal uh, 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 question, clinical question, but sometimes to prove, tell that is definitely schwannoma, schwannomas almost 95% of the time, we have published in AGN that it will bleed, shows microbleeds, and if you can do SW, you can actually see these microbleeds, I can be pretty sure that these are schwannomas. This is very clear case of acoustic schwannoma with an ice cream cone appearance with a positive face, which shows that these are microbleeds. But meningiomas are great mimics. Sometimes meningiomas actually grow into the internal auditory meatus. We can, and they can calcify. For example, this is a calcified meningioma. If you look at only the SW image, this is, we will tend to report, although experienced radiologists can say that this is, uh, there are enough conventional radiological features to suggest that this is a meningioma, but if you are not sure, you can actually run an SWA sequence in the face. Face shows this is black and this is calcium and this is a calcified meningioma which is actually proved to be. So there are some mimics and uh, 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 pitfalls, the trigeminal lipoma, any lipoma, intracranial lipoma can show susceptibility uh, uh, changes just like which is having mineralized or blood. We don't know the exact reason. Part of this may be due to chemical shift and part of this is the mineral content within these lipomas. And there are earlier papers from radiology which, is, which says that it is due to calcification, which is not true because we don't see any calcification out there. Maybe because it was a combination of the, the chemical shift as well as the susceptibility effects of the mineral content of these lipomas. You can see the exactly same phase information as that of blood products or mineralization so you should not actually miss it for uh, uh, this, anything which is bright, you should not actually stamp it as blood, you should do a fat separate sequence to show that these are lipomas. Another uh, differential may be a mini, mm, uh, 
melanomas. Melanomas, even without bleed, can show susceptibility. Uh, changes is the meningeal melanocytoma, which is showing susceptibility changes. You can see the perioperative field, which is actually uh, stained with melanin. Again, degenerative brain disorders we have seen consistently in uh, multiple sclerosis and degenerative brain disorders, cortical basal syndrome and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You can see the, the primary motor neuron disease. You can see the white matter change in the corticospinal tract. They are secondary. The primary change, the mineral deposition within the, the gray matter of the, the motor cortex, you can actually see in most cases of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You should look carefully when there is a referral that there is mineralization. So this sort of mineralization you can see only in SWI and only with the face processing and only with thin slides slices of a, a 3D degrading echo sequence. And again, posterolateral pertaminal mineralization, posterolateral pertaminal hyperintensity, less of mineralization of the basal ganglia. You can say that this is multisystem atrophy of the Parkinson's type and not a classical Parkinson's disease. In trauma, uh, this is, uh, has replaced uh, uh, probably other sequences, uh, probably uh, uh, other than diffusion. Uh, uh, most of the sequences are replaced by SWI for uh, detecting diffuse axonal injury. I had a video, but unfortunately it is not working. So you can see that uh, the, you can see multiple hemorrhages, especially in the brainstem and the splenium, micro leads in, in the setting of a trauma, this will suggest that there's a diffuse axonal injury. And if you see diffusion restriction as well as micro bleeds, it basically suggests a bad prognosis. Oxygen saturation imaging, like by just by looking at this image, we, we know that something is abnormal. When there is anesthesia, kids are, this is a kid, uh, kid's uh, brain which is done under anesthesia. When they are uh, getting done MR under anesthesia, the veins used to disappear, which I will show later. And uh, you can see that these uh, veins are prominent even after anesthesia. So something is wrong, we can actually look for uh, the cardiac uh, changes. So for example, this is a congenital synodic heart disease. So obviously we knew before giving anesthesia, just to show you that this can be detected by looking at the MR. This is because of the polycythemia and the high or uh, low oxygen saturation within these veins and the high hematocrit these patients have. Uh, about uh, anesthesia and effects on anesthesia on SWI, these are different patients uh, done without anesthesia and with uh, propofol and sevoflurane anesthesia. Depending on the depth of anesthesia, you can see these cortical veins disappearing. You might have already op observed this. This is basically because the brain metabolism comes down, the oxygen demand comes down, oxygen within the veins will increase, and also because we use oxygen associated with the anesthetic agent, so these veins disappear. This is a normal phenomenon. So, uniques of SWI is a high resolution 3D gradient echo sequence. Uh, full, uh, flow compensation so you avoid artifacts. Thin slices would give you better, uh, better partial volume. I mean, it takes away the changes of partial volume averaging and you can see uh, things better. And filtered face images will give you enhance the local changes of susceptibility and you operate both on magnitude face and you have SW as well as many, you have multiple parameters to look at your diagnostic confidence will increase. So um, this is uh, the conclusion, so uh, I will stop. I have uh, uh, some publications, we have some publications on this, and uh, the future is high Tesla, as, uh, as I mentioned. It's a seven Tesla image, which is SW, you can see this transmedullary veins very well. The next sequence coming up is a swim. This is a susceptibility image mapping, so intensity mapping. If you but put a cursor on this, there is a September JMRA article from Hackey's group. If you put a cursor here, like a perfusion or ADC values, you get the venous saturation value. So it's a multi-echo SWA base sequence. So this is the next sequence which is coming up. I don't know whether this has already been sold to Siemens, and it's just an experimental evaluation phase. So soon we will be talking about swim, putting a cursor, and looking at the venous saturation. So we can.